Cypher that makes this uh, weekly meetup happen. And we are also powered by the Coffin Foundation out of Kansas City. Uh, right now in more than 120 cities around the country, you can find a One Million Cups chapter. Um, we're very blessed to uh, have many chapters come and participate. Actually, Sanford is launching a chapter, so check that out in September uh, based on the work that they've seen uh, happen here. So that's pretty neat to see that start to spread a little bit closer to home. I uh, wanted to ask how many folks are new to One Million Cups today. Please put your hands up, your first-time visitor. Anybody want to share real quickly how you found out about us? And, uh, uh, Michelle from the Friend Union invited us. My name is Rob, and this is Richard from Paypal. Excellent. Oh, we got cool. well, thanks for being here. Um, please help us continue to spread the word. So with all that being covered and said, let's get to, the, to today's speaker, who is David Toon. And uh, David has been coming to One Million Cups. You might have already had a chance to meet him, but he's got an amazing uh, invention that he's created. He's also uh, served in, uh, in the armed forces. Uh, so I had a lot of experience, a lot of background, and he's got a, just a great project that he's going to present to us today. Uh, so be kind in your questions and your feedback, but also give him some real value that he can take and implement into his business. So with that, help me give it up for David. Million Cups for those who support and those who are sponsored. Again, I couldn't be here without you guys, so thank you very much. Let me grab the uh, clicker and see if this all works. Um, I'm currently at Embry Riddle. We have a few Embry Riddle uh, folks out here, and I want to thank you for supporting me today uh, doing the master's program. This has nothing to do with that. However, it makes me smarter so I can work on my project more. So, what you're about to see is a, uh, a work of and from the heart. It's been 10 years in developing, um, and it's my company called Energy Smart LLC. And what it is, is pretty much, um, let's see if I can get this to fire up, windmills, the dynamic blade windmill. Most of you have like, oh, seen windmills before. Yeah, you have. Unfortunately, most of us can't play in that market because we don't have three to five million dollars to throw up a big white windmill in some clean air stream somewhere uh, in, in the U.S. However, uh, once you get done with this presentation, you might think differently on how to uh, use windmills for your own use. Here's a quick uh, history lesson, not really a history lesson, but a uh, lesson on windmills. There's vertical axis and there's horizontal axis. You've probably seen these from time to time if you've traveled. These are horizontal axis windmills that actually have aerodynamic system to them that have to have clean air. That's why they're very tall. Where they're very big, and they're completely optimized, computerized. Uh, not going to be much of an improvement except they just get bigger and bigger. Uh, I'm sure some of you have seen the Dutch form, American multi blades out there. Uh, these are all considered horizontal axis wind turbines. Can everybody see? I don't want to get in the way here. Okay. The vertical axis wind is a, um, another family of wind turbines that obviously spin in a vertical axis. Uh, scenario. One's called a Savonius, which is the regular cup. Have you ever seen an uh, anemometer where the little cups spin around and give you the wind speed? Well, that's a Savonius uh, system, but all, it, all it's doing is just giving you the RPM wind speed. The Darius is a form of the horizontal axis over here, a high speed blade, because it also has an aerodynamic blade involved in it. However, since it spins like a top, that aerodynamic blade has a really high wind uh, tip speed for the blades themselves. So in fact, because these are still pictures, you don't get the sense that this is really a Cuisinart. These things really spin pretty fast uh, to be efficient because that's how they're designed. So let's go into the history of windmills. 1700 BC in Iran, they had windmills that were vertical axis turbines. Yeah, and they use it for grinding uh, wheat and that type of thing for the farms. What, uh, what they did on this one, it's kind of hard to see, but these would spin only because the wind was coming towards us, if you're uh, standing like the pictures oriented. And there's a little slot in the back of the uh, structure where there's a wall back here. So as the thing turns, the returning blade doesn't hit the wind going forward. That's how they reduce the the uh, wind pressure on the returning blade. However, what's the problem with this design? One way wind, that's right. Wind's any other angle, you got, a, you got a problem. So the engineers obviously had to choose the average winds throughout the year, what's gonna work best for them. They put it all together, it probably worked. 
20 days out of the year, maybe 30, depending on where you've set it up. Local winds sometimes are a little more consistent. Now we're gonna go through all the history involved of all their uh, different improvements for this, so hold on. Oh, that's right, there's only one other improvement. <laughs> that's mine. What we did, instead of putting a, a building together here, we decided to come in with a dynamic blade. And this is what it looks like. And I gave it to my uh, fabricator uh, back in Phoenix, Arizona, who shout out to Chaz, he was awesome. So I handed him this, I said, hey, this is my design, this is what I want to do. On the retreating blade, I want it to be solid, but when it comes back through the wind, I need it to go away. I need it to release that pressure, so I have nothing but torque. He said, okay, let's give that a try. So Chaz built it for me. I'm like, that's pretty good. I did a little CAD design through the test, I did a little aluminum work, bam, here it is. So okay, that's great. Now I'm going to test it. I don't have a wind tunnel. I wish, I wish Dr. Spitzer was here, our wind tunnel guy. Um, I was bugging him earlier saying, hey, I need to put my stuff through your wind tunnel. He goes, no, you don't. Just put it on your truck. I already did that once. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to uh, set this in motion. You'll get a chance to see why CAD is not always the best to design it. This is just a concept. This is the first one I put together, showing you the first prototype. I just wanted to make sure it worked. It's not even close yet. Hang on. I did this on my dad's birthday in front of his house. <laughs> this is a retirement community. <laughs> not that bad. See the blades getting out of the way? Yeah. All right. That's called success in concept. I may want that on their roof right now. I'm like, all right, that, that didn't work too well. So I said, all right, what's this going to do then? So I still had to have the concept to uh, make this functional. So what I did is I went back to the drawing board and said, okay, I've got to make it work. You can't hear it. Well, I'm back in CAD again, so you can't hear anything, right? But all right, I've got to do some more, uh, some more fun things. So what I did is instead of letting the blades slap together, I decided to let them be independent. And this is the actual sound it makes now. Wow. Tell me if you hear the windmill. We'll do that again. Wow. I'm sitting in the cab with the guy who helped me build this, looking through the split window, just filming it. So I got that part down now. So now I've got a windmill that works and is quiet, which is hard to do for vertical axis windmills. So what makes it different? Well, the dynamic blade windmill was designed to be efficient, silent, and also it has an interactive blade system in it that is passive. Not many systems out there do this, not all three. And what happens is I make sure that the magnetic system we put in it will solidify on the power side and then open wide, wide open on the return side. That way I deliver all the torque I can out of the wind that's humbling. Again, this is a low level wind system, so I'm not gonna get clean air, which all the other aerodynamic blades need. I don't need that, I just need something to hit the blades. So I'm, I'm a little better off than that. So this is the main difference in the Savonius. This is the main improvement, is that we relieve the pressure of the uh, forward blade. Okay, what winds and where? I had a question earlier, what winds? We're in Florida, maybe a hurricane, I don't know. A good windstorm or a thunderstorm will be produce it. But here's a map, and everybody says, well, what's your market? Anything in blue? Can you see that okay? Here are the uh, wind categories down here. Just to make that little light blue here, you have to have 10 mile an hour winds that are consistent. So all along the short lines, if you live along the short lines, this windmill will pay you back. Obviously, through the central United States, you're good. And worldwide, that looks like this. United States centralized right here, Florida not so much. South America, so excuse me, um, Russia, parts of Africa, 
I only need is one good windmill for Antarctica. I can run all of Antarctica with one windmill. <laughs> I mean, look how much wind is down there. That's a lot of wind. Australia, you got some good spots. It's pretty flat. So this is what we're looking at um, for solar. I was also we're talking to a gentleman about solar. This is solar energy spread where the energy is possible. Florida happens to be in an area that has a lot of, lot of solar energy, and that's okay. I'll explain later why that's important. All right, now we're going to go take a real quick look at power, power out. Coefficient of power up here has a best limit of 59%. Some guy named Bet said can't pull any more than 59% of the energy out of the wind or torque. That system. Like, okay, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know who Mr. Betts, but we use his, uh, his theory. So this is why the big white windmills out there in Texas are used because they produce such a high power coefficient. They're getting close to five, or excuse me, 50%. Tip speed ratio is a little high, so for a 10 mile an hour wind, you might see a 50 mile an hour blade. That's really what it's saying. So that's that's why they're called bird killers. The bird flies through in a perpendicular direction. That blade can be anywhere from 50 to 80 miles an hour. It won't see it. It just comes across the top. So that, it still has problems because of that design. The next thing we uh, we have here is the American multi-blade. You see this in all the westerns anyway, and it works. Uh, still needs um, some height to it, but as long as the wind's hitting it, you'll get it. It's about 30% on a coefficient of power, but the nice thing is it's got a low uh, tip speed ratio. So it's not really killing any birds out there. And the other one is Sabonius uh, system. Unfortunately, it's probably one of the weakest on the chart. Dutch forearm, even though it's pretty, the Dutch did a really good job of making it steady and pleasing. I put this on my house, it's just not super efficient. And again, we got a tip speed ratio to start to climb up here. If you see the uh, other ones, I call these the Cuisinart, Darius. They have a really good small area where they have a good power coefficient. But again, they're, uh, they can whip up to 7.5 7 times the speed of the wind going by it. And that's a problem. What we want to do with energy smart, let's get out of the way so everybody can see this. This is our comparison. So what we want to come in and do is keep the tip speed ratio down as low as we can, but try to nearly double the old Sabonia style by offloading as much pressure as possible so it's not fighting itself in operation. All right, we're going to do a little bit of shark tank at the end. We're going to do a little bit of family feud here in a second, and probably some prices right, so hang on. This is, uh, this is my brother working on the blade that uh, you saw earlier. Uh, what we're doing is uh, developing the passive resistance through the magnetics, uh, rare earth magnetic system we have. This is, at the time, the only moving part was a polyethylene bearing. That's how we reduced uh, wear and uh, complexity of this thing. The whole purpose is to be able to take the low level wind energy that is usually wasted passes by your house or off your boat and convert it into some sort of torque that you can use for either pumps or generators. Our system also is the only system out there that's self-protecting. If the winds get too high, it will protect itself and I'll show you how. Our competition. Anybody see these before? Maybe a couple? There's a stadium that recently got built that has a bunch of these on it. They went green. Right. But that's okay. I'm, I'm all about green, but we'll see some numbers on the uh, Helix Wind and why that may not have been the best purchase. All right, uh, here we go. Family Feud. All right, this side is the north side from the columns over the side to the south side. North side gets first question. If I'm an inventor, which I am, also a drummer, which makes me a bad businessman. That's why I married my wife. She's a retired attorney and entrepreneur. Um, and what we've done is come to you and said, okay, what would you say to a brand new product like this? What's the first question that you have, north side only, what's the first question you have for an inventor that's got a new invention out? Is it Oh, what I hear? Cost. Yeah, survey says unit price. Normally, number one question is what's going to cost me? All right. South side? South side. You're up for the next question. You're now an investor. I've got this 
this great invention. Your first question is? Oh, is that what I said? Time for return of investment. That's amazing. You guys are good at this. All right, I'm not going to waste any more time. Yeah. <laughs> so I have a little bit of time, right? We're going to also look at noise produced. I think I made that kind of clear in the last one. We're going to also uh, take a look at curb appeal, aesthetics. I talked to my wife when I was building this initially 10 years ago. She goes, I'm not putting that on the road. I go, what? It's a windmill. They had arms everywhere. It's doing all sorts of things. She goes, that is ugly. Ah, now my next market problem is to make it aesthetically pleasing. All right? Of course, it's got to have power output, correct? Price per kilowatt hour. Uh, does anybody know what the kilowatt hour price is for electricity in Florida where you're at? 13 cents. 13 cents? Okay, I've got a chart coming up that was based on 8.5, 8.35 in Arizona when I did the chart. But there's a spread depending on commercial or residential, so you kind of got to look through it when you're, when you're looking at your bill. Okay, annual power return, what it, what it puts out annually. Cut in and cut out speeds, anybody know what that is? When it turns on, when it turns off, just basically. And uh, maintenance departments, pretty important. Got to know how to maintain it. All right, what do you think is the most important competitive criteria? Competitive criteria between windmill companies. For me, it's cut in, cut out speed because I'm the inventor and I get to say so. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the reason why. It's not a windmill if I can't deliver energy. If I can't deliver energy, it doesn't matter what price I put on it. You don't want it, correct? If it has a cut out speed that's too low, you may still not want it because you live in a high wind area. Hurricanes, it's got to be able to handle a hurricane. Okay, so that's what we're doing. Trying to make sure we have the cut in, cut out speeds right. Well, I only invented the blade. I didn't invent the generator or the pump system that goes on. But there are systems out here that are called axial flux generators. They have very low cogging, which means if you grab an uh, alternator and try to twist it, it has that, that uh, jump to it because the magnetics are trying to line up inside. It's really hard to start. From a dead start, real hard to get past. This thing doesn't have that. So it makes it easy for a little bit of wind, a little bit of torque to get started. That's the cut-in speed. That's great. Now, if I'm in a high wind situation, how do I control it? Exactly. So, here we go, some numbers. Got some business people in here? Hold on, buckle up. This is what we're looking at. So, the four manufacturers that I was targeting in my market been out this way. Power, output, price, and return. ROI. Anybody see that? That's actually in years. That's off their website. That's a problem. Look at the weights. <laughs> you will it down a couple of generations, you might get there. I don't know. And so, even with the Helix win, I mean, they had it on the stadium, the football stadium they just put on, 62 year ROI, as is. And it's also pretty heavy. So, Energy Smart said, let's make it lighter, better ROI, better pricing. And see what we can do. What would you What would you pay for a system that is comparable to 1.2k out for watts? It might give you an augmentation of uh, 2,000 kilowatt um, hours per year. What would you say? These guys want 5,000. I said, you know, I could probably get in that market. So what we did at Energy Smart, they said we're going to come in at 1.4. I'll put in a five. Theirs is only two. Why is that? Well, it's a different system, but it's not very efficient. That's the issue. It's also a Cuisinart. This thing spins probably at eight times the speed of wind. And also, if you look at ours, I can probably bring this down a little bit. This is just initial numbers. Um, bring this down to single digits. And it only have 140 pounds worth of um, product to put on your roof. Now you don't have to reinforce your roof. You don't have to reinforce your boat. It's like a lightweight sailor on your boat. You're just adding one more guy. That's it. Uh, your roof can handle 140 pounds because your roofers are not 140 pounds. They're a little bit bigger than that. So our target markets are military support, disaster relief, residential, and uh, green belts. Sometimes you have just out in the middle of green belt where all the buildings are away, some decent winds. Why not put it on a gazebo and let the HOA reduce your power requirements, right? 
commercial, and even developing countries. I don't have to have it on an electrical generator, you can put it on a pump. I had a lot of folks I've talked to, farm wise, they're like, yeah, that would be great out in the middle of nowhere. I don't have to scream any power to it. It just does what it's supposed to do on its own and keeps all the, uh, the water systems going. And here's some ideas that uh, I had in the dark when I was developing this in the little corner of my room going, what else could I do with this? So we have solar and wind with the compression panels in place that increases the wind as it hits the panels. Uh, maybe 5, 10%, not much, but enough. Throw a solar comp uh, component on it so now I can scavenge some solar energy from the footprint of the windmill itself. Uh, open style so it can handle really high winds if needed to. Compression style again without solar panels, and why not throw it out in the ocean? Make a little totem pole out of it. Instead of the big, huge white ones they've got out there now, they're killing birds. You won't know it because the sharks get leftovers, but they're still killing birds. All right, so we know it's custom. <laughs> custom. You can custom, customize it and you can scale it any way you want. All right. Why am I putting a solar panel or solar component to my windmills? It's kind of, this is secondary. But the HOAs don't like it. So if I put a solar panel on my windmill, they can't stop it. Because 12 states actually have laws on the books that's, that allow you to put a solar system on your property regardless of what the HOA said. Can't do it with the wind turbine. So this now just became a self-cleaning spinning solar panel. <laughs> you laugh. <laughs> I used to be an assistant general manager for an HOA. I know how vicious they can be. <sighs> anyway, latest design. I was going to have the film cut at this point, but I'll let it go. I'm not going to give you too many secrets, but this is the latest and greatest. Everything I just showed you before were all my old. Uh, digital versions that are now in my digital archives museum. You can come by my computer and see it sometime. Uh, but this thing is my next and, and last uh, prototype, and the reason why I'm displaying it in, in public. I've come out of the business closet after 10 years. The business environment is improving. Uh, there's a chance for alternative energy to have another shot. So I decided to, to bring it forward. This looks kind of silly. And it took me, uh, it probably took me two nights to put this together. I'm really slow in CAD. But I went back to my manufacturer, fabricator guy, and said, this is what I want. And you know, he's really nice, because he said, here's, here's a scrap pile over here, David. Just, just go pick out pieces and whatever. Because I'm a starting student, I, was, you know, I didn't have much money. I said, okay, I'll, I'll go play in that. So I put together a, uh, a version of this. I said, hey, can I, uh, can I strap that on your buddy's truck? <laughs> Got a wind tunnel test it, right? This is my wind tunnel test. It looks really funny, but you gotta hear this. It's, oh, don't want to do that. Let me back it up. Let me see if I can get this fired up. Oh, this is, this is great. So this is my latest version. It hasn't been polished up yet. I have another one that's on the books. It's gonna be built next year. But I want to see this work. Now I got two weeks to get to Ember Riddle from Arizona. So I developed a little CAD picture, told my fabricator, hey, can I use your spare parts? He goes, yeah, there's some scrap metal. It's like Frankenstein, right? So I said, okay, I'll make it work. I just, I just need the parts and pieces. So I think you understand the concept of this one. I'm still working it out. It actually works. Yeah, it actually works. Yeah, when the inventor says that. <laughs> oh, he's only doing about 15, maybe 20. A real simple concept. There's only a 90 degree turn on the on the axis for both blade that's going forward and blade returning. Airport right over here, along this road. 
And now, if you're in I'll show you something even funnier. So it worked at 20. So what's an inventor do? They get a 40. We're not done yet. I don't have a magnetic system on this one. This is all mechanical. Oh, there it is. It failed. But with another important part of this one, it fails to a stop. Kind of important, especially if you're in a hurricane, you don't want to fail into a spinning cyclone of a problem that adds to the hurricane. So it fails to a stop. So I'm like, okay, good. I knew what happened. I knew where the stress points were. That's the FBI regional, regional building in Arizona. <laughs> we drove by that several times, never got stopped. <laughs> so, that's it. I've got a windmill that's coming into the market. I'm not selling you one today. But I'm looking for comments, uh, what, you, what your first impressions are, because it still has to go through a market study. Uh, Florida obviously has got some, some challenges set by the seashore. And uh, let me get the question in the back real quick. Are you, 